get to meet a whole bunch of people from all over town. Everyone seems very enthusiastic and very fun. I've been doing this thing green for over uh, a good six months now. And the food looks really great. It makes eating vegan food really accessible to an average person. It kind of gives somebody who's new to vegan eating a really good creative ideas for what to cook for yourself. The presentations are always really good. Steven is so enthusiastic and friendly. Um, they give you tips on uh, foods that you can buy in the grocery store, what stores to go to, where to get the cheapest, best vegan products. It's like having your own personal chef who's already tried and tested everything before beforehand so that they can give you the best possible product to try yourself at home. So just a really great event. Absolutely love it. And I love it. I think the presentation is awesome. If you're in the Vancouver area, you should definitely check them out. Meetup.com. And on the White Rock too. Check out the White Rock or, the Va or here in Vancouver. It's just an, a no-brainer for anyone to come and try it out. So it's great. Come along. family was Christian, but um, going to church, I used to see it more of like a chore, because we went to a, uh, it was an Adventist, I don't remember what it was, but we went there, and I never really, it was just kind of something we did, it wasn't like exciting or anything like that. My name is Rebecca Bird. I am 15 years old and I'm in 10th grade. Nice. When my mom was a kid, she went to Mountain View Summer Camp in Hope and she wanted me to experience that. And so I went uh, summer of 2014 and um, the year before I went to camp, we, my mom got, was just getting out of um, cancer treatment and everything, and everything was quite hard. And then we, when I went to the camp, I saw how happy everyone was. And it was kind of, it seemed like they were all like that way because God was in their life. And I never really felt that. And I felt that for that one week, and I wanted that in my life forever because it was just an amazing feeling. I went to my mom and I told her that I want to start being more serious about becoming a Christian and I want to study the Bible and I want to uh, get to know God better. And my mom, she bought me my first Bible, which was 
Amazing. <laughs> I still have it. She helped me study it. We do like a Bible study every every night, and um, now that we're in Vancouver, because my mom came down for school and I came with her, um, and found. Oak Ridge Adventist Church, which was amazing. I never knew church could be like that because church before, was, it, it seemed so boring and um, like I didn't want to go, but now I want to go to church and I want to learn about God and it's, it's exciting now. Good morning, OAC. Good morning, Good morning OAC. Good morning. Happy, Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thanks for making it out on this uh, not so sunny but not a rainy day, right? All right, can we stand, please, and have a short prayer? Father God, just thank you for bringing us here, bringing us through this week, um, taking care of the battles that we had to fight, all the battles that we didn't know of, um, God. But just thank you for bringing us here with this family. Uh, help us have a wonderful day.
Hands for Jesus, sorry. Turn around and greet somebody. Welcome again, OAC, and welcome to our online viewers, and thank you for joining us today. Um, happy Sabbath, and we hope that you enjoy our worship.
of hand, y'all. <sighs> Guys, I don't know about your week, but man, this week has been very testy. Uh, my voice is going, and uh, we had a struggle during worship practice last night, but we're here to celebrate God's victory, amen? amen. And no matter what the devil throws at us, we're just going to press on and praise on, amen? amen? All right, so scripture says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may, you may proclaim his excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to us, to, to our fathers, by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of, every, of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power.
that shines in us. Become the light that shines in us. There's no darkness in your way, so have your way.
Hallelujah. Good morning, church. My name is Josh Gambaragi. I'm one of the church elders here. And I want to invite you for prayer. And the last uh, two, three, four weeks has been a very challenging uh, time for most of us. Uh, seeing our dearest friends you know, pass. But you may not be you know, mourning the passing of your friends or anything like that. But you may be going through, you know, different challenge. Maybe it's a broken relationship or you're looking for a job. You just graduated and you're looking for a job and haven't found one and there's no hope for you even to pay rent. Or you are going through different situation that is very hard for you to understand. And I want to encourage you to put everything on the other and God will take care of that. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to ask you to find a place. <clears throat> if you can kneel down or you can bow down or just stand to something to give God glory. And I want to remind you that our God is so wonderful and so faithful. And I look I read my Bible in the book of Luke 11, verse 9. I can also read Matthew 7, verse 7. It's all the same thing. It says, I say to you, ask, say these words with me, ask and you shall receive, and seek, you shall find, and knock, the, the door will be open to you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, what can we say? It's just so amazing for you to give us this Sabbath to come together and worship you. We want to thank you, God, because you are an awesome God, and we, we are so glad that you found us. We didn't find you. We want to say we are here to worship you. We are so glad and this is why we call you with many names because human language is so limited when it comes to expressing your greatness and giving you glory for all the things you have done in our lives. We want to thank you and we call you the Prince of Peace and we want you to give us that peace, the peace of heaven, the peace that passes all understanding. We call you a wonderful counselor, a wonderful teacher. Father, teach us today how to trust you. May you teach us that you are there in whatever situation we are going through. But hold us tight in your embrace so we, we can be stronger than life's challenges. Thank you, God, for all the things you have done to us. We ask you, Holy Spirit, now, we ask you to come and dwell with us. We ask for your presence. We want more of you in our lives, Father. May you rain down your Holy Spirit, rain down your mercy, rain down your blessings, and rain down your glory. And we want to just put everything on the other, be it is break, broken relationship or we're struggling, whatever we are struggling with. And you, Father, listen every little prayer that has been said here this morning. We put Pastor Steve into your right hand as he comes to speak to us. We ask you, Father, that you bless him. We are asking for a special prayer, especially for this, for this two, Pastor Stephen, Pastor Rode, who have been serving you faithfully. So many pastors have quit their jobs, but they are here to serve your people. But Father, bless them and encourage them to keep working in your field. Thank you, God. Let all this be done for your glory and honor. In the name of Jesus, let everybody say amen. amen.
So the two main reasons why I tithe is because um, one, long time ago, my friend Lawrence taught me that the money that we receive is not ours, so it's good to give God a portion back. And secondly, my mom taught me that um, your tithe represents your trust um, in God and how he will provide for you. Uh, so in the last, I don't know how many years I've been employed, I think I've been um, unemployed for like two weeks in the last million years. and. I'm not saying that tithing guarantees employment, but for me, it just, it shows me that I trust God and I trust what he's given me and I trust that he will provide. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath, Oak Ridge Adventist Church. It's June the 10th. And that little video by Peter Paul was just a little introduction to remind each and every one of us that God is faithful and that when you bring and support the cause of God in the city of Vancouver through the avenue of Oak Ridge Adventist Church, through your faithful tithes and offerings, your church and your staff and your conference are really, really amazed at your faithfulness. We want to say thank you. Do you hear me? Thank you for your financial faithfulness to what we do. And seeing as it's the middle of the year, we just wanted to remind us all of the principles of stewardship and remind all of us of God's goodness and uh, the kind of gratitude that we can have for the way in which he blesses us but also to be financially accountable to you. We'd like to show you sort of what the middle of 2017 picture is like. Even though we're not really all the way in the middle, we're, you know, we're halfway through June and we really won't have June statistics until the first or second week of July. But this will give us a little bit of an idea. We're five months in, a trend of, of how our giving is going. So I'd like to sort of bring you up to speed on that. But I, I want to also kind of just remind you a little bit of how tithes and offering work. Um, all the programs and all the staff that you see at Oak Ridge Adventist Church, save for my salary, which uh, by God's grace comes uh, through the returning of all the tithes of the British Columbia Conference members, uh, everybody else that works for our church is supported by you marking your tithe envelopes local offering. Our capacity to do the things that we're doing is when you donate directly to Oak Ridge Adventist Church. And so we wanted to sort of remind you of all the good stuff that we've been able to accomplish because of your faithfulness. So I'm just going to run through a couple of slides here so that you can see uh, sort of a picture of where we're at. This is just uh, a clear January through May. Uh, you can see in the light blue church budget and in the dark blue tithe. Uh, our tithe is always significantly higher than what is donated locally here to Oak Ridge for our programming and our costs to operate this building uh, and to fund our programs and to fund our staffing initiatives. So you can see sort of how your giving compares. And you'll notice on your Adventist giving envelope or on your tithe envelopes or if you use PushPay, uh, our online giving app, uh, you'll see kind of places where you can give. So that light blue portion is what stays here, and the dark blue portion is what goes back to the British Columbia Conference to support all of God's work in British Columbia and further beyond. So this is uh, a clearer description of what our needs are. So you'll see that uh, this year we sort of budgeted and we had a, a sort of a stretch goal that we thought we were going to reach and we, we still believe we can reach it. But you'll notice that January and February were particularly low months in terms of what we took in locally compared to what we budgeted. And in fact, five months in, we've never met budget. Uh, in terms of our local giving. So uh, we are about $36,000 behind. Let me put up that next slide here. 
So you'll see uh, May 2016 to May 2017, uh, sort of year to date comparisons. Last year we gave about $105,000 in tithe to this point. We're at $100,000. Uh, to this point in May, so only about a $5,000 difference. And then last year, we had about $60,000 donated in church budget to the end of May, and this year we're only at $45,000 donated by the end of May. So that's, uh, you can see sort of the, how far behind we are compared to 2016. But uh, the more important one is what we've actually budgeted. So to date, we've budgeted $82,000 um, that should have been collected through May 31st, and we've only collected 45 of that. So we're actually 36, almost $37,000 shy of our budget for this year. So we believe that God is faithful. We believe that God is going to continue to bless what we're doing here at Oak Ridge. And you guys have been so great. We, we reached our, nearly reached our holiday love offering goal. And we know, we know that the bottom line is we sit there at staff and we just, we know that we are blessed here at Oak Ridge, whether it's rental income or the way in which you guys give back and steward your money. Uh, but we just want to invite you, if you want to help us here this month in June and July and August, sort of get us back to when we get to that last uh, quarter of 2017 that we're feeling like, hey, we're, we're meeting our financial needs here as a church. Um, that would mean so much to us. So a little later on, we're going to take up an offering, but first we're going to continue on with our worship service and with the preaching. So again, thank you. Thank you for your faithful support of Oak Ridge Adventist Church. Let's pray. God, we are about to go into the preaching of your word. And we've sat for a moment and considered what it means to be stewards of all that you've given us. It's not easy. It's not easy for us to wrestle with money uh, to wrestle with what it means to live simply and faithfully in this world. God, life can be confusing, but we're here and we're looking for clarity from your scriptures. We're looking for insight on the best ways to align our lives with your values. And God, when we fall short, when we miss the mark, when we get carried away with our pursuits, Father, bring us back to your heart, bring us back to you. And may today's worship service be just a small opportunity for that to happen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been in the middle of a sermon series entitled From the Inside Out, and it's a 10-part series on the Ten Commandments. And we have been studying about how these commandments were meant to operate in order to actually accomplish what God set out to do with them. And so today we are in the, right towards the end of the commandments now, we're wrapping up and we are quickly accelerating towards some really internal kinds of places. We're going to get to lying and we're going to get to coveting these things that are, are more difficult to sort of determine where you sort of stand with God on them because you can keep a lot of that stuff private between you and God. And nobody needs to know. This is sort of that last one, stealing, where maybe the external world can hold us a little bit accountable for the expectation that we won't take that which doesn't belong to us. And so my sermon this morning is entitled, Taking That Won't Fill the Void. How many of you recognize this ring? Yeah? Well, I want to tell you maybe, maybe the precursor to Tolkien's use of the ring in The Lord of the Rings. There was, back several thousand years ago, a Greek philosopher by the name of Plato. And in a book entitled The Republic, Plato describes what he calls the Ring of Gyges. And this ring was a special ring. It was a ring of anonymity. 
Anonymity is that ability to sort of become invisible and not be seen. And Plato, wrestling with what it means to be moral and ethical in our world, thought to himself, could it be that the only reason we align ourselves with any moral or ethical values is because of the social constraints, the people that we encounter, and we don't want to appear to be evil, and we don't want to appear to be wicked, and so because we may be held accountable by those around us, he says maybe that's why we choose to do good and not evil. And he said, but what if, what if there was a ring that when you put it on would make you invisible? What would you be like? What behaviors would you engage in if there was no chance of being caught? Plato, like many moral philosophers, was wondering what's happening on the inside out. Are you true and right because your heart is true and right? Or if you were granted the magical ability to disappear and to just go around this world with no chance of being caught, what kind of behavior would you engage in? Nobody knows, nobody knows what your heart is really like. Did you know that? How many of you know that you keep your heart and the internal workings of your heart rather safely cocooned away from the world and the ability to risk and to be vulnerable and to be raw is not something that we're very good at. And so when God begins to express his desire to take our hearts of stone and to make them fleshly again so that we could live with the capacity to love God, to truly love God, he begins to take these commandments and he begins to show us the deeper foundations of them. And so on the surface, this commandment, you shall not steal, seems rather basic. Don't take things that don't belong to you. I could basically just sit down and say, that's it. That's what God is about. That's all this commandment is about. When you sit there and you see something and you maybe feel like you might have access to that and you kind of check your shoulders, does anybody see what I'm doing? And you take it. Or for those of you in college, you're Googling your latest paper and you're like trying to figure things out and you're like, oh, that's a nice paragraph, copy, paste. Maybe if I change some of the vocabulary. (laughs) Victor, I love you, brother. You must not steal. Just seems basic. On the surface, there's not much to it. But when we actually allow the commandments to penetrate into our hearts, we begin to notice, like Plato knew, and like Tolkien knew, that if we had a ring that could give us magical powers, what would we be like? I believe, I believe the root cause In the times of my life when I have felt the most angst and the most desire to fill the voids of my heart and thinking to myself about the inequalities and my relative level of poverty compared to some other people. You know how badly I want to drive a BMW M3? People. I'm in the midst of transitioning vehicles right now because of Volkswagen's lies, which we'll be talking about next week with Peter. I don't know that he'll talk about Volkswagen, but that'd be a good illustration, Peter, of lying. But Volkswagen lied, and so they're having to make restitution to people like myself who thought eight years ago when I purchased my car that I was buying the green car of the year, only to later find out that they had completely fudged the electronics and that it was actually polluting some 40 times more than they said it was. 
but I can't tell you, you don't know the dissatisfaction in my heart as I begin to approach the, 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 the ability to buy a new car and, and kind of what I want versus what I can afford. And I sit there in my relative poverty in a fairly affluent city and I'm a driver. Anybody ever driven with me yet? Anybody been in the car with me? Lizzie was in the car with me on the way up to Pemberton. And uh, uh, Julian was in the car with me on the way to Pemberton. I like driving. And I like driving fast. And I like to be assertive. <laughs> Don't worry, Karen. I drive very carefully when Diego's in the car. But I have, I have my heart, my heart is secretly dissatisfied with my vehicle. I like my vehicle, but it's just not fast enough. <laughs> and so right now I'm in the valley of decision, okay? The 2015 TDIs can be fixed, but there's this 2013 Type R. Now, for those of you that know cars, this is like Volkswagen's little Golf Hot Hatchback. And it's used, it's got about 90,000 kilometers, it's at Cowell Richmond, Volkswagen. It's got an aftermarket exhaust like my car. It's got some aftermarket suspension parts. And I really, really want to buy it. But here's the thing. Now careful, we're talking about stealing here, and we're talking about my internal heart, and we're talking about stewardship, and we're talking about what it means. And if I make that financial decision, and maybe I'm preaching about it to hold myself accountable publicly, so if I pull up with a blue hot hatch, don't judge me. I'd be going beyond my financial means right now, a little bit, to purchase it. In order to fill that void, but you know what? still not the car I want. When will I ever fill that void? When will I ever achieve that thing? And that's what stealing is all about, isn't it? Why work when you can steal? Right? Think about it. Stealing is a shortcut. Stealing is a shortcut to the things you're trying to do and maybe, maybe hard work, if you work hard enough, you might be able to save enough money to do the things you'd like to do, you know, uh, given a, a reasonable scenario. But for many, many people, as they sit in the inequality of the economic system and they look at their hourly wage and they look at all the homes and peoples around them, they have this growing, like, like Mick Jagger told us, I can't get no satisfaction. And our hearts, we, we keep them secretly here and we don't tell people about how, how deeply dissatisfied we are because of the consumer mindset that we've been, we've been, we've been raised in. And God knows this. He knows that the, the next great idea, the next great car, the next beautiful home, these things that we might feel tempted to steal, either money or power or people's dignity, and that's really what stealing is all about. Stealing is all about looking at your neighbor and saying, you worked really hard. Whatever you did to purchase that vehicle, to purchase that house, to save that money, to buy that jewelry, whatever it is you're purchasing that somebody might be tempted to steal that iPhone, it's sitting there and you're saying, you know what? All of the hours that that person worked, all of the energy that they put into their work, it actually matters a lot less. That person's dignity matters a lot less than my dissatisfaction. My dissatisfaction takes precedence over all of your hard work. And if I have access to something you worked hard for and I can take it and I won't get caught, I'm going to take it so that I can feel a little bit better. And our society today doesn't help, does it? We haven't learned the art of delayed gratification. We are in the middle of an instant gratification kind of world. And so when we think about the number of years it would take us in order to save enough money to purchase some of these things or to go on some of these holidays or to find ourselves uh, with enough intellectual capacity to come up with our own ideas rather than lifting them off the page of some, somebody else, uh, 
or whatever kind of stealing you might be kind of tempted to engage in, it's about instant gratification. It's about filling that void the moment you feel it. And our world has programmed us to long for that. Instant filling. Matthew chapter 6, however, Matthew chapter 6 is something that has helped me process my own relationship to money and belongings, my own relationship to where I place my heart. And it's not easy. Let me tell you, I am in the midst right now of many challenging things. And so when I reflect on Jesus' words, I have to let them, I have to let them go deep. Matthew chapter 6 says, Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy. And here's the things, thieves do not break in and steal. We're talking about stealing this morning. We're talking about taking those things, those ideas, people's dignity, and using them to try to fill our own voids. Stealing is fundamentally a miscalculation of our actual needs. I'm going to repeat that. Stealing, we engage in stealing because we have profoundly miscalculated what our actual needs are. I need a vehicle that will economically get me from A to B that I do not despise driving. I don't need a vehicle that's going to get me from A to B super fast in a city that I can't even drive fast in. And so if I engage in that, in a sense, you might even not even think of this as stealing, but really I'm stealing from all kinds of other places that God might be asking me to direct my funding. And so the stealing hierarchy, there's just the, the basic level of don't take something that blatantly doesn't belong to you. But really when, when stealing enters into the stewardship place, this idea of treasure in our hearts, now it's not simply about taking that which doesn't belong to you, but taking the very things that do belong to you. Taking the very things that do belong to you and carefully and meticulously wondering how you might use them lest you steal from your family, from your community, and lest it be stolen from you. And thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus goes on and he says, Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So stealing from the inside out, people and their dignity, personhood, and material possessions are not shortcuts. Do you hear me, church? Listen, you may never be tempted to physically take something from somebody. You may never steal somebody's wallet, phone, car, uh, possessions. You may not struggle with that kind of stealing. However, all of us, at various levels and in various times in our life, we have been tempted through sarcastic remarks. We have been tempted through uh, politics in the workplace. We have been tempted through inappropriate Facebook comments. I read this week online and it, and it slayed me. I should have put the slide up. It was, uh, it was the uh, uh, internet anonymity theory. Ever heard of the internet anonymity theory? <laughs> Person plus anonymity equals jerk face. There's this anonymity that happens like the ring of Gyges. Oh, I'm hidden behind my computer. I'm just going to lamb base this person online. And you're stealing their dignity. 
You're stealing their personhood by these ad hominem attacks when you are degrading something or an idea or something you are trying to make, you're trying to fill that void. I'm not like that person. And so you stomp on their dignity and you steal it and you throw them under the bus. These are all elements of stealing something that isn't rightfully yours. People are not shortcuts to your fulfillment. Do you hear me? There's been a lot of stealing in the news today. There's a lot of stealing uh, <laughs> that some of you may have heard about. And so I want to tell you that stealing happens. Stealing happens when community breaks down. And we begin to feel isolated. And when we begin to feel isolated, it's a little bit like having that ring on. We look around, we say, nobody's paying attention to me. Nobody really cares about me. Nobody really cares what I'm feeling. Nobody cares about the dissatisfaction in my heart. Nobody's asking me how I'm doing. Nobody's befriending me. Nobody's asking me out to dinner. Nobody's taking me places. And you begin to feel isolated. And when community breaks down, and then you see somebody else who seems to be, whoa, man, this stage, we've got to fix this. I'm a little too walky. Okay, I'm going to, shh, boundary, boundary. I'm going to kill myself one of these Sabbaths. So when community begins to break down and we feel isolated and nobody's reaching us and kind of finding us, that's when we kind of feel like maybe it doesn't matter if we take something that doesn't belong to us. Just think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. It's a lot easier to steal something from a stranger than it is from somebody you know. True or false? True. True. One of the antidotes to a thieving heart is profound community. When you can look and know the people you are with, you are far less likely to take advantage of them. When you love them and respect them. When you saw the 55 hour work week that they put in for the last five years to save that down payment, to buy that place, the level of dignity and respect that you have for that person makes it and, 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 and it, it creates in your heart an affirmation of their value and you are far less likely to take advantage of what they're doing. And so when, when bonds of community are built in and around us and we spend time with people, we are not going to engage in those things that take away from them. And so as we sit here as a church and we think about the inside out and we think about rings and we think about whether our morality is, and by the way, Plato was right, could it be that we are moral and ethical because we are in community? Maybe God knew, maybe God knew that the only way our characters can be formed is to spend time with each other. So, if you have a little kleptomaniac in your midst, somebody who likes to steal, you know, funny thing is, uh, Monday morning, Monday morning, I walk into my car. I haven't even told Sister Gloria and Brother Oscar this yet, but I walked into my car and my paperwork was everywhere. And like, I was like, somebody's been in my car. And uh, I looked around and I was like, but they've left all kinds of things. And I thought, oh, uh, I must have left my car unlocked. And you know, my paperwork was everywhere and stuff was everywhere. They didn't take my Bible. They, they, and then, and then I pulled out of my, my driveway and it was sunny and I went to reach for my sh sunglasses and I was like, no, my new sunglasses are gone. Just this week, I, believe it or not, Monday morning, Logan's in there, Diego's in there, everybody's in there and I'm getting my car, I'm ready to drive to Deer Lake School and both pairs of my shades were gone. Now, I basically left my car open and people helped themselves to my belongings. But that feeling in my heart, I was like, man, if that person knew that I can't afford those again and that I really liked them 
and they had been my friend, they probably wouldn't have taken my glasses. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's just kind of a silly thought, but you, you sort of realize that the anonymity of just somebody's car sitting there and you're walking by the window and you smash the window and you take something that's not yours. They didn't have to smash the window, they just opened my door. But it felt horrible. I'm putting up some logos here on the screen. Those of you that are of my vintage in your mid-30s, some of the older millennials, may recognize some of these logos. Napster was famous, of course, back about uh, 17, 18, 19 years ago. And I'll never forget when CUC got high-speed internet. And I was there, and I was like, every song and album is mine for free. And bandwidth was just sucked up all night. We'd leave our computers running 24 hours a day, just loading hard drives with MP3s. I full on stole thousands of dollars of music. Thousands and thousands. I don't know how many albums I had on how many hard drives while a theology major in university. Not even thinking about the fact that these people had poured their blood, sweat, and tears into creating this music. And I simply helped myself to it with the aid of technology. And it was my first lesson in how anonymity gave me license to steal. I would have never walked into an HMV and stole a CD. You guys remember HMV? <laughs> it's like a bygone era, it's a dinosaur. Gotta make sure you guys remember these things. I would have never gone into HMV and stolen a CD. Not, no, no way, not a DVD. I, that level of like the fear of getting caught and it's like social constraints and I was not a pickpocket, I didn't know what I was doing, but sitting behind a screen with no chance of being caught and the whole world is doing it and it must be right if the whole world is doing it. The whole world of piracy was this gigantic world of theft. And it was this mass social experiment that all of us had that ring of gaijis like, the chances of them catching me are slim to none. And we just stole to our heart's content. And you know what? We went to sleep at night and it probably didn't bother us. And so we sit here this morning, we sit here this morning and we have to ask ourselves the question in closing. Why was I able to sit there and steal somebody's creative work and music for free and Windows and Adobe and whatever else we stole and pirated for years not thinking about it? not even wondering about it because of the anonymity. And I want to reiterate, I want to reiterate that I believe stealing stems from a fundamental misunderstanding of what fulfills. And stealing is a profound desire to consume our way out of the poverty of the soul. Those things you think you need to make you feel happier. Those things you think you need to make you feel better, more joyful, less powerless. Those people you feel you need to step on in your workplace in order to climb the corporate ladder. That next promotion that you're willing to do, whatever it takes, and fudge sales numbers, and make it appear as though you're doing something, that's all theft. That's all stealing. And God is calling us to profoundly look into our hearts. Man, I'm having some heart moments lately. It's not pleasant when God brings conviction to our souls. And I, I'm telling you, you wake up in the morning, even on Sabbath mornings, and you're like, Lord Jesus, what, have you to, what are you doing in my heart? I don't know if that's like you, maybe just because I'm a pastor and I feel the, the gravitas of some of these things in, in a different kind of a way. But I just know that God is up to something in my life. 
So we played Peter Paul's video earlier of his heart of giving and the habit that he has formed in returning his tithes and offerings to God in a sense of stewardship. So if stealing is taking that which doesn't belong to us, then I want to suggest that as we look to Jesus and his example and what it means to be a cheerful giver, I believe the antidote, that thing, so you don't just remove something. Jesus teaches us that when you just remove something, you are leaving a void and there's a chance for seven more devils to get in there. So it's not just abstaining from stealing. What we need to do is we need to replace it. And Romans 12 says, overcome evil with good. So if you have an evil heart, if your heart is being challenged by God, you can't just say, God, my heart is evil, remove the evil. God says the only way to overcome the evil in your heart is with good. So I want to suggest that if you are struggling with a sense of stealing things, whether it's somebody's dignity or their money, and whether or not you have found the perfect anonymity loophole, you sense that the ring is on your finger and you know the chances of getting caught are slim to none but you want to be changed from the inside out. You want to live for the right reasons. I believe we need to develop a heart of giving. And we need to find the heart of restitution. Returning to those people and places and things, that which we have wrongfully taken from them. So between you and God, whether you're a child in here and you've stolen a fidget spinner, or you are an adult in here and you are in the midst of some high-level white-collar criminal activity, God is asking us to give back. Have you stolen somebody's dignity? Do you need to make a phone call and say, hey, uh, a little while ago, I took advantage of a meeting I had with the boss to say some things that weren't true about you because I wanted to get ahead and I'm sorry. God calls us to make all that is wrong right. I don't know, I've thought about it for years. How do I like return to all my favorite bands of the 90s? You know, like, do I just go out now and buy all their albums on iTunes and say, okay, for years I benefited from your music, you know, cheaply, and now I'm going to go and purchase all that music that I stole? I thought, is that restitution? I don't know. I've bought a lot of albums since then. I don't know that I've bought all of them. I mean, I, I just, I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. I, I, I had albums I'd never listened to just because we could. I was really impressed with this story. This story blew my mind. It just came out three or four days ago, Globe and Mail. It was on CBC. It was amazing. In the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there was this admission by the Canadian government as representatives of the early pioneers in this world, uh, in this new world that sort of came in and, and there was all these people, we call them the First Nations uh, of the North Americas, and we displaced them. We took land that wasn't ours. And so we've gone through this process of trying to create restitution and trying to own the fact that we stole their dignity and we stole their land and we stole their way of life. We just removed it. We just, we just ran, ran roughshod with it because we had power, because we could. And... Uh, the Canadian government's been trying to make this right, and so they've been giving uh, payments of restitution for people that were in residential schools and different things like that. And this last week, a previously homeless man took, I don't know if it was a portion or his entire restitution payment from the Canadian government, and he was homeless for a time, and he had been helped by this Rotary Shelter House in Thunder Bay, Ontario. And he walked up to the front desk and he offered them the full money that he had just received, I think it was all of it, to the shelter to help them continue to run their programming. This blew my mind. 
the Canadian government is trying to make things right and this person was hurt in residential schools and received a payment and took that very same money and he paid it forward. And the person on the other end of the desk said, uh, listen, I think you need this a little more than our organization does. And he said, no, no, please. And guess what? Reverse anonymity. Not one of the news articles that I looked for gave the person's name. Jesus teaches us in Matthew 6, when you give with your right hand, make sure your left hand doesn't know what you're doing. We are the opposite. When we steal, we want anonymity. When we give, put a placard up, please. Whoa, the upside down kingdom, that antidote, that antidote to, to feeling empty is not to say, oh, I'm gonna give and I want everybody to know I'm gonna give and give me a plaque for giving. No, no, it's much like this. You give so your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing. And guess what happens when you engage in good? Your heart starts to change. I applaud this man as an example of Christian love and benevolence. And he probably doesn't even claim to follow Christ, I suspect. So I want to close. Band can come out. I know you guys have been standing back there for a while. I'm sorry. <laughs> love you guys. This is a longhouse. Longhouses are beautiful examples of life together. When you're looking to fill your dissatisfied soul, when you're singing Mick Jagger's tune, I can't get no satisfaction, and you are tempted to steal your sense of belonging uh, in the world as somebody who has material possessions or has positions of power and you're willing to do it at the expense of others, I want to remind you of the purpose of Christian community and the purpose of the Ten Commandments and God calling us together as a church. He has placed us in the midst of the very necessary antidote, living in a long house. This is a place where many people coexist. And that social construct of being with people and sharing meals together makes it far more difficult to find ourselves in the place of being willing to take things from those that we shouldn't be taking things from. And it stands in stark contrast to our individualist, i put one more slide up there in closing, Western culture of the gated community. And if you live in a gated community, I don't, it's not, it's not judgment. It's just saying there's a huge difference between this idea of keeping people out and keeping things away and being privatized and living in our own bubbles and, and, and that isolation that leads to all kinds of, of internal criminal behavior. I invite you to open the gates. and to find yourselves in the longhouses of Christian community that will help our hearts stay in tune with what it means to live with Jesus. Heavenly Father, I wanna close this sermon with an invitation as our eyes are shut and our dissatisfied hearts are open before no one but you. God, this dissatisfaction, this poverty of the soul pushes us to all kinds of behaviors that we do not espouse as moral or ethical and given an HMV scenario would never do. But God, we find ourselves in a world that is increasingly individual, increasingly compartmentalized. And Father, I pray that those wounds that open us up to the potential of stealing, Father, that you will bind those wounds and that you will fill us with hearts of gratitude and giving that we will engage in overcoming the evil of our hearts with the goodness of your message, Jesus, that our treasure is in loving our neighbor and not stealing from them.
God do something in our hearts that we cannot do for ourselves. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What an amazing sermon, guys. I actually never thought of you can steal in so many different ways besides the obvious. But Steve, I know how much we love our TDIs. Stick with the TDI, buddy. <laughs> Please stand as we sing our theme song. Offering. Oh, sorry. After, okay. After we'll have our offering.
Um, so could we invite the deacons up for um, offering? We have a prayer for the offering. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for um, your blessings to us. Thank you so much for your mercies which are near every morning. And in light of the sermon that was just spoken, I pray now that you bless us as we return to you what is rightfully yours. Bless our hearts and give us a cheerful heart for giving. All these things we pray because we believe in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. to see all your beautiful faces in the place with us today. And I just have a couple of announcements. So first of all, uh, to my left, your right, we have seven minutes or less. And I believe, uh, is it Karis is here doing seven minutes or less. So after the worship service, please join us. We have a swag bag for you. And we promise not to keep you for more than seven minutes. Also, if you're looking for someone to agree with you in prayer, to my right, your left, we will have one of the elders on duty that is um, that is really looking forward to pray with you and anything that you want to bring forward in the Lord, someone is there to agree with you in prayer. Now we have a couple of announcements and some things that I would like to emphasize. First of all, um, the OAC Ladies Book Club invites you to join for a book exchange this Wednesday. June 14, 6.30 p.m. in the chapel. Please bring and apply to, no, please, 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 please bring a copy, sorry, to share and any books that you'd like to exchange. And also bring a girlfriend to come along to this fun, friendly evening. For more information, please contact the church office. Secondly, we'll be having a Father's Day barbecue that's hosted by the young adults. That will be happening this, no, next Sabbath, June 7th after church in the fellowship hall. So this is for fathers and also for everyone who loves to eat. So I will be there. Uh, join us after that. <laughs> um, my father's in Jamaica, so I'll take his share. Um, join us after Sabbath in the fellowship hall, I believe, just to celebrate this, uh, celebrate this day. Also, we'll be having Multicultural Sabbath, one of my favorite Sabbaths at OEC. That's coming up on Sabbath, July 1st. And my favorite part about it, um, in light of the previous comments, is that we have an Eat Around the World potluck, and that happens at 1 p.m. So I believe there's a table outside as well. We encourage you to bring a food item from your country um, to give to everyone, to share with everyone. And I'm excited to try all the different foods from all around the world. And to close, we like to thank you again for joining us today. It's also, it's always so, so wonderful to see you all. And I pray that you have a wonderful rest of Sabbath. Thank you. All right. We want to give a shout out to our online viewers. We have somebody from Trinidad this week. Woo! Germany, Liberty, New York, Seattle, Washington, Memphis, Tennessee, Ultwa, 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 Tennessee, Arn Pryor, Ontario. Anybody know where Arn Pryor, Ontario is? Really? West of Ottawa. I looked it up as soon as this list came to me. I was like, I've never heard of Arn Pryor. Montreal, Quebec, <coughs> Alberta, Calgary, Abbotsford, Old Road, Chilliwack, Pitt Meadows, Port Coquitlam, Surrey, Burnaby, West Vancouver, and Vancouver. We love you online vu viewers. We want to remind you of the visitor's potluck downstairs. If you're... Shout out to Mavis. All right. We love you, Mavis. One of our Vancouver viewers and longtime member and prayer warrior of our church. But if you're a visitor and you're looking for a potluck meal, you're more than welcome to join us downstairs for that. If you're a longtime member and you're hungry, you too are welcome to join us. But we invite our members to be contributing individuals to the potluck. No mooching. 
All right. No stealing. <laughs> Father God, thank you so much for Sabbath. Thank you for lovely, beautiful faces. Thank you for your spirit. God, continue to do work in us. Continue to teach us your ways. Forgive us for the places when our words and deeds have failed you. And Father, lift us up to new heights. Transform us from the inside out. Thank you for our worship team. Thank you for our elders that are going to pray with people. Thank you for our visitors. God, we just want to build a community, a longhouse, where all that we have is one and in common. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. We love you. God bless. another episode of Healthy Snacks with me and my dad. Today we're making one of my favorite breakfasts, fruit smoothies. All right, so what goes in first, bud? Milk. Yeah, okay, so we usually make enough for him and his brother and for me, so let's put about, uh, fill it up to about here, okay? I'll tell you when to stop. Keep going. Keep going, keep going, and stop. All right. Now, because we're plant-based at our home, we're always looking for ways uh, to make a sort of a protein-filled breakfast. So we love our Vega Sport. We're all real active people. And so we put a scoop of Vega Sport in there for all of us. There we go. This is a fantastic plant-based, clean protein source. Do you love the flavor of this? Yeah. Yeah, it makes every smoothie a little creamier, right? Another little thing that we do, we like to find healthy fats, little ways to add healthy fats. I just sort of gauge it. Again, hemp hearts are a great source of plant-based protein and a great source of fats. Okay. All right, and then you can throw whatever fruit you have today. We just have a bunch of stuff that we brought from our freezer, and so we'd like to just start dumping them in. Put them in, we got strawberries. We love strawberries. Put them all in, all of them, shake them in. All right, okay. We got some cherries. And we've got some pineapple. I love pineapple. And we have some blueberries. And then normally we have frozen bananas, but today we got banana mush. <laughs> and we usually put about Still one. Still makes a good smoothie. Yeah, it makes a great smoothie. We put one banana in there. All right, and then we turn on our blender.
So we forgot to put some uh, salt in there. We put usually just a tiny bit of salt. It brings out the chocolatey flavor. And so we'll just whip that up real quick here on Pulse. That's it. And then we pour ourselves some smoothies. Murkovich boys love to have some smoothie in the morning. And it's delicious. Logan, what do you love about these smoothies? They're filling. Okay. They're sweet, and I love the thickness of it. And don't you love the fact that they're healthy? Yeah. It's like a dessert for breakfast. Ready? Cheers to a healthy breakfast.